Well, it's the end of the year again. A time of joy, of giving, and of spending time with friends and family. Toot toot. In a time such as this, one might almost forget that the United States of America is literally on fire right now. Don't worry, Jacques. Soon God will exact his revenge upon us for our imperfections. A present? Well, Jacques, is, it, is this for me? Stop. You shouldn't have. Oh my gosh, is that a Tim Allen sweatshirt? Jacques, surely I'm dreaming. I will not be an accessory to your crime. I'm perfect! I'm finally perfect! And hey, you know what this sweater reminds me of? You guessed it, the most celebrated Christmas film of all time, Christmas with the Cranks, starring Tim Allen and Jamie Lee Curtis. And listen, okay, this right here, just one, all right? Just, just simply one in a long line of prestigious Tim Allen Christmas films. We also got Santa Claus one through three. Look at that, feel the weight of that. How many villas in the south of France do you think that'll buy a man? A jungle to jungle might count as well, but uh, the science hasn't come back on that. We're waiting to find out. And when you're looking at something like that, you just gotta stop and ask, how? Okay, how did this happen? Martin Short may be looking a little Martin Short on money. Now this is a prestigious article. I make a pilgrimage to the Santa Claus 3 wiki every year if I can. This section's plot summary may be too long or excessively detailed. Come on, guys, says Wikipedia. Come on! Who bothered to make the plot section of Santa Claus 3 this detailed? Shorten it on principle. There we go. That's more like it. Anyways, ain't no Christmas complete till you sit down and watch a classic Christmas flick. So without further ado, I present to you the abomination that is Christmas with the Cranks. It did, didn't it? It did, didn't it? It hit Sergio straight in the dick. All the lights are coming on now How I wish that it would snow now I wish that I could stay We should get moving. Got a big day. Merry Christmas, everybody. So, this film begins with middle-aged couple, Luther and Nora Crank, taking their daughter to the airport as she's about to leave for Peru. That would in turn explain their sadness, as this is the first Christmas they'll have to spend without her in a classic syndrome of the empty nest. Think she'll be okay? She'll be better than okay. I meant in Peru, in the jungle. Please stop worrying about this, okay? Psh, with this again, would you please stop? Why don't you just go to the jungle? What's there, snakes? Yellow fever? She'll be fine. Just won't be the same. What won't? Christmas. With a great melancholy, the Cranks prepare to spend the holidays all alone. Joy abounds! Um, I need white chocolate and pistachios. What are you looking for, Tim? I didn't bring the umbrella. Didn't bring the umbrella. Oh, I need that stuff from Chips. Still needs the stuff, Tim. I didn't bring the umbrella. Didn't, didn't bring the umbrella. Well, I still need it. Uh, you said that already. Been over this? Done this? Okay, look, you stay in the car I'll and I'll go, get I'll him. Go. So because Mrs. Crank needed some pistachios, Tim's dirty ass is about to go through the wash. And that's basically where we're at with this film. Hey, but at least we get to see Tim Allen do the funny face. I'm getting wet is annoying. You could use an umbrella! I just need some white chocolate. Good point, Tim. You didn't get the white chocolate. Oh my god, the flow of this movie is like pulling teeth. You, you didn't get the white chocolate, Tim? If that's all you went in there to get, how'd you screw that up? Who would even bother to write this exchange? It's so mundane. We're five minutes in, all we've been talking about is pistachios and white chocolate. Their cadence is so slow and they just keep repeating the same things white over and over ad nauseum. Umbrella. Umbrella. Did you talk to Rex? Who's Rex? Who's Rex? Come on. Tell us. The Butcher. The Butcher. As odd as it sounds, I didn't think of asking the butcher where the chocolate was. So basically, thus far, this is a jaded couple arguing in a low-energy and passive-aggressive manner. The Christmas film. God bless. I'll go talk to Rex right now. Maybe he'll wonder why I'm all wet. You know why I don't want one of your stupid umbrellas? Tim, I can't say I'm not upset. This easily could have been Jungle 3 Jungle had you just gone with your daughter on the airplane. 
huge missed opportunity. <laughs> because Tim's character Luther is so upset by the annoying Christmas season, he devises a plan to skip it all together to go on a pleasure cruise. <laughs> Fuck Christmas. I'd rather trick my own urine than celebrate Christmas. Thanks for coming and watching this Christmas movie with us, everyone. Have a grand old time. <laughs> the first time in 23 years Blair won't be here. A lot of depression at Christmas, you know? Tell me about it. I have to eat a whole bottle of Prozac just to get through the second part of the month. I would just love to forget about it. <sighs> what are you looking at? Why are you looking at me like that? If you keep doing that, I'm gonna have to call the police. I think it's a form of harassment. If Tim Allen looks at you like this, I think we're gonna need legislation. This probably gonna fix itself. Tim's rape stairs apparently work their usual magic as Jamie Lee Curtis gets so hot and bothered she wants to make Whoopi right there on the table. Luther, it's not even Saturday night. It's not even Saturday night, you know? The night we literally apparently schedule having violent sex on the dining room table. We have an idea. Yeah? Just let it be known that I never asked to see Jamie Lee Curtis that truly sexually aroused by Tim Allen. Yeah? But, but I got it anyway. Hey, careful what you wish for. They should be saying careful what you don't wish for. Yeah? That! What are you doing? Sit down. Apparently, though, Luther didn't have the hanky-panky in mind as he was just excited to reveal his genius scheme to skip out on Christmas and go on the cruise. He's so horny at the idea of fucking off, he tells her to fuck off. Sit down. Button up and sit down. Jesus Christ, man, let her down easy. We spent $6,100 on Christmas last year with precious little to show for. Luther explains that the previous year they spent over $6,000 on the holiday season. He argues that they may as well use the funds this year for a vacation to the Caribbean and skip out on the whole process altogether, actually saving money in the process. It's like I said, worst thing about Christmas, having to sit there and do Christmas, huh? Oh, well, what a boring stinker that is. That's my goddamn eggnog. Chokes on you, stupid bird. Eggnog is poisonous to birds for various reasons. We skip Christmas. Well, we can still give our charitable donations to Children's Hospital and, and of course, the church. Now, this is where things start to get weird. I'm not sure if the writers were just out of touch or trying to get the target demographic of 75-year-old couples from the Midwest, because just after Nora's sexy episode, she starts to make a big stink that she can't go on the cruise unless they make a donation to the church. You're gonna let a lousy 600 bucks stand between us and a Caribbean cruise. No, you are. All right, all right, look, I'll match last year's contribution to the church and to the hospital, but not a penny more. Oh, thank God, the church! Matching contribution to the church! Can't live without that! Glad we resolved that plot point in literally 20 seconds between two scenes. I think this movie might just be a webcam live feed of a real couple's life. Oh, it's not even Saturday night! Then, of course, like a normal person, Tim's character walks around his office handing flyers to everyone, notifying them that he's skipping Christmas. Because, as we know, in real life, Christmas is mandated by law, and anyone who fails to comply is an enemy of the state! Who would do this? Why would anyone care? No one cares if you leave on Christmas. I'm letting you know that I'll be skipping Christmas this year. Go ahead. Run. But we will find you. But yeah, that's basically the whole story of this film. That everyone surrounding the Cranks is so concerned with them skipping out on Christmas, they get socially ostracized like they're living in Victorian England or something. So what would happen if someone just literally needed to leave town for Christmas? This is so out of touch it leaves the realm of plausibility. Mrs. Crank, we've got to talk about your Christmas invitations. Um, no. No party this year. No party? No Christmas Eve party? She's not ordering Christmas cards either. Indeed. And I hear a rumor she's having a baby out of wedlock as well. Then why don't you have the party anyway? Because we don't want to, Mary. Yeah, I think it's about time to move to a new town and change your name. So the Cranks proceed to go around town, needlessly pissing everyone off who is apparently part of their yearly holiday routine. The uh, Canadian blue spruce last year. Oh, this one's a real beauty. Almost 10 feet tall. Mrs. Crank likes the big ones. We're not buying a Christmas tree this year. Sorry we had to go up on the price. We're making less per tree than last year. It's not about the money. We're not doing Christmas this year. We're gonna go away on a cruise. We don't need a tree. Yeah, how do you like that? You little punk, trying to make a decent living for yourself while making my life joyous, warm, and convenient? Here's what I think of your fucking tree. How's this for a Merry Christmas, you bunch of young, innocent children trying to foster a loving community spirit? 
It's really a movie about the spirit of the holidays, you know? Really looking forward to the Santa Claus 4. Want to know what happens in that one. Don't know why they haven't made that one yet. At this point, basically, the Cranks are neighborhood enemy number one and have pissed off just about everyone because they're not staying in line with traditions. Because after all, the holidays truly are about crippling communistic-style conformity, aren't they? Dan Aykroyd is in this film, too, for some reason, and he becomes upset with them because they won't put their giant Frosty the Snowman sculpture up which apparently every single person in this neighborhood is required to do the same exact one. What is this, some sort of cultish ritual? <clears throat> gonna, uh, some, someone gonna say something here? Perfect time to put up Frosty. Tell you what, truth is, if I'm gone, I'm... Eh, <laughs> yeah, you know, this movie was better as a horror anyway. <laughs> it was an accident. What? The cattle grow a new spine? Who cares? I think this movie may actually be a masterpiece. You know, it's got an American Psycho thing going on. It's as if the protagonist is actually the antagonist, and you just find that out as the movie goes on. It's brilliant, really. Luther is just the most irredeemably horrible person of all time, but the way the film portrays it, you'd think the writers would want you to sympathize with his plight. But then as Nora tries to leave the neighborhood, the conformist Nazis in her town try to physically force her to give up the snowman they want from her, slowly turning the movie into a Mike Myers nightmare and what I can only assume is a throwback to Curtis's earlier works. Nora, stop the car! Stop the car! Please, listen, hey, don't do anything you'll regret! Now please. But look, it's okay because shortly thereafter, Tim shows off colorful underwear in his local Irish pub. Huh? Woman's bathing suit? Nope. Got my own. I don't. I just. I, I don't really know. But at this point, I'm numb to it. There's no way we are wearing these on this cruise. These aren't for the cruise. Then what are they for, Tim? What are they for? You know what's odd is when an Irish pub serves fish tacos. I don't get that. You're a simple man, aren't you? Apparently, Luther got the bathing suits to go to a tanning parlor pre-cruise so they could look, you know, their best for the cruise. Nora, on the other hand, is apprehensive. Dear God, this should be outlawed. <laughs> I feel your feeling. I know what I feel. And then, of course, Nora's local pastor shows up to see her naked boobies, as one does, because comedy. Back at home, Luther brings in the local paper to show Nora, and they've made front page. Because apparently the only thing this town has to worry about is what the cranks are up to. But this, this is the final straw for Nora. As if the Orwellian nightmare she's been living in wasn't enough. She decides to throw two fingers up and enjoy the idea of the cruise after all. Oh, I'm sorry I'm late. Hey, what's wrong? I can't switch back for the third time. What is this bombshell about cancer? What is this movie? A comedy? A drama? A horror? A satire? Undiscovered Shakespearean classic? The tone of the movie is never consistent. One minute it's goofy, the next minute it's terminal illness. How do you think this photographer got the shot? Well, he climbed up. On your roof? Yeah. Well, why did you do that? I don't know. Walt? I just heard about Bev. I'm so sorry. <sighs> How's she doing? Uh, remarkably well, you know, in good spirits. Mm. If there's anything we can do, let me know. Thanks. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm very deeply, truly deeply sorry about the cancer diagnosis. <laughs> This is the best film ever made, folks. It's just that simple. So at this point, the film takes a turn, as Luther and Nora's daughter, who left for Peru at the beginning of the movie, calls and says she'll be making a return for Christmas with her new fiancé after all, foiling Luther's plans of the trip. The next bulk of the film is just slapstick nonsense of them scrambling to get ready for the Christmas party they weren't ready for. And it even includes a funny ham gag and real child abuse. Go infinity and beyond! Don't hurt that child, Tim. You still have another 30 years of Christmas films to make. You can't make them in jail. Unless you're making Christmas with the Cranks, too. Luther gets a perforated rectum. Don't be silly, Tim. Leave that child alone for your own good. Come on. Luther! Okay. Actually, it was a suicide attempt. <laughs> but then, in the twist of fate, like one hour in, the movie actually starts to pick up a bit and feels like a real holiday film. That's a bigger twist than Shyamalan could have ever cooked up. A true Christmas miracle. All right, people, listen up, gather around. We're about to have a party here at the Cranks. 
A Christmas homecoming for Blair! The town sees that the Cranks need help because they can't get their party together in time, so they all pitch in to get supplies together before the daughter's plane lands. It's kind of nice, actually, and reminds me of the best parts of Christmas films in general. Oh, oh, hold on. Why should we do this for him? Yeah. 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 He's a jerk. And good things never last, like this pants. But we're a community, and the people in a community stick together, even if one of them has been behaving for most of the holiday season like a spoiled, selfish little yeah. baby. Why should the daughter pay for the sins of the father? Christmas is about giving, and family, and love. Except for to some people who I would rather be in a mass grave, whose name rhymes with Bim Rallin. But yeah, beyond my wildest expectation, I actually found myself enjoying this final part of the film. I think it captures the Christmas spirit perfectly, even if by accident. The police even help out too by picking Blair up from the airport and bringing her home just in time. Luther makes amends with his neighbors and redeems himself by giving them the cruise tickets he now won't be using because he'll be spending the holidays with family. Hey, hey, uh, does this mean we have to start being nice to each other? Of course not. Good. But I still don't like you that much, old man. Man, that's kind of fucked up, dude. He just gave me the tickets. Then, just before things are about to wrap up, a robber that snuck into the party attempts to steal jewelry from the cranks and make a getaway. Get out off the roof! Oh, get my car! Oh, oh. My ground! Hey, what's in that bag? Oh. oh, Lord! Umbrella Santa from the beginning is back! I really think you need an umbrella! You know what they say, if you show an umbrella in the first act and you don't use it by the third, uh, you haven't written a Tim Allen film. You're the guy that was selling the umbrellas in the rain, aren't you? It's a living. Thank you for the party. Hey, you're welcome. I'm sorry you got to work on Christmas Eve. Santa always has to work on Christmas Eve. It's the real Santa, isn't it? Merry Christmas! It's the real Santa! Praise Jesus! And there it is. The film ends on a nice little note. While in some aspects it's one of the most tone-deaf films I've ever seen, there's just something lovable about it. Just the fact that no one in this entire movie seems like they want to be there, yet somehow it turns out all right in the end. And isn't that, at the end of the day, what the holidays are all about? Being forced to be with a bunch of people you're only lukewarm on for long periods of time? Hey, in my eyes, it's perfect. So Merry Christmas and Happy New Year from New York, baby. It's 28 degrees outside. Give me your best Tim Allen noise. I don't know who that is. Tim Allen, you know from Home Improvement, from Jungle to Jungle? I don't know who is. Who, who's that? Who's Tim Allen? Nobody really knows who Tim Allen is. Seriously, this is not a joke. Come on, what does Tim Allen sound like to you? If I say Tim Allen, you say. Uh, You're not very wrong. Woo! Did you? Was Tim Allen here just now? Yeah, I love America, USA, USA. Tim Allen, Santa Claus Three. Yo, listen, real talk, man. This is not a game. Do not go to these churches anymore. They steal your money. They sell drugs. The only church that is of God is the seven churches in Asia. Those are the only churches that are of God. And they show, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I am Allah. There's no reason why God sells drugs, God do all kinds of things. If you can't tell me what holy means, you can't tell me what that means. I'm building a church called the seven. My church is going to be on fire. So I'm asking you to stop supporting those churches and support me. Thank you so much. Could you give us your best Tim Allen? My who? Tim Allen. I don't know Tim Allen. He chose me. He chose me. Out of all others, he believed me up. That's good. Thank you. He chose me. He chose me out of all others. He believed me up. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful, man. Have a nice night, Merry Christmas. Yeah, all your ass go to the home because I done told all you. Yeah, I told you. Let's get the fuck out of here right now. Ho, 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 it's me, the Christmas ghost of a word from our sponsors. This episode of John Charm was sponsored by the lovely people at audible.com. If you don't know audible.com, they are the premier provider of your audiobooks and audio products. You could take your audiobooks on the go with your phone, tablet, or just listen to them on your computer. And as a special offer, if you go to my specialized link, audible.com slash John you get a free 30 day trial and a free audiobook. Even if you cancel, you keep the audiobook. This time around, in the spirit of the holidays, I recommend to you a Christmas carol written by Charles Dickens and narrated by Tim Curry. Go pick it up, you won't be disappointed. The Christmas is just too much!
Ever seen Home Improvement? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Jungle yeah, yeah, yeah. to Jungle. Yeah. Yeah. The yes, Santa Claus. Ooh, 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 ooh. Do it again. That's what he does, like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, do, 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 oh, like that. yes. Do you know the yeah. like that? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. That's, that's Tim Allen. Can you, can you give me your Tim Allen noise? I still don't know who Tim Allen is. You still don't know who Tim Allen is.